So, good afternoon to everybody. Um, we are here for the last event of Political Dialogues, um, which is uh, supposed to be at the, about uh, spaces of dialogue. So, um, I am Andres Anderigo from San Rocco, the magazine. Um, here we have uh, Altra and Christian Kuhn from the Austrian Pavilion, the commissioner and the co-curator. And we have uh, Paola Vigano, thank you very much for coming, um, which is, I mean, I guess you might know her. Um, she's uh, teaching uh, in Venice, Lausanne, she was teaching in the States uh, uh, recently, and she's uh, managing a very big office uh, of urban planning. No, <laughs> it's not off. Okay, it's small, but having big commissions. Um, so, I would uh, immediately start with a set of questions to our dear participants, and then maybe even sit down in order to be more comfortable. Um, yeah, my, my first question, uh, uh, it's maybe too direct somehow, but um, I mean, when I arc back to, for example, uh, Roman architecture, no, and uh, I understand it as a somehow a, a very powerful uh, project of civilization uh, done through architecture and master planning uh, and managing the territory and so forth. Uh, my question would be, um, is it still thinkable for architecture and planning uh, to have such an influence on the behavior of people, on the possibility to, to, to how to say, to, to empower a certain uh, political discussion, the possibility to not only to, to host it, but even to, to, fundamentally, to fundamentally, uh, give it a boost, you know, to make it possible and to, even now, I mean, in which, let me say, uh, the discussion seems to slowly shift towards uh, the social media and towards uh, means which are not strictly related to space. So my first question, maybe to to Paula, would be this one. Okay, this, is, this first question is is very is very wide and probably can absorb yeah. all the time we uh, we have. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you, thank the organizer, the the curators of, of the of this pavilion, and uh, also let me. Um, situated a bit myself in this context, which I, which I think is, uh, is interestingly ironic. <laughs> I, like, I like this ironic situation in which people are passing. We are, this is already, already clarifying that uh, we, uh, we uh, the experts, are in a different position <laughs> in respect to the past. So, uh, in a way, this is already an answer to your, to your question. But I want to start trying to uh, to develop a little bit of this. Uh, it's interesting your reference to the Romans uh, because uh, it is exactly uh, reflecting on the Romans uh, made infrastructures that uh, uh, the term second nature was coined. So it was by looking at the big enterprises, uh, the grids that were put on territories solving problems of drainage, problems of accessibility, roads, uh, canals, um, aqueducts, uh, that the idea of a second nature that was uh, imagined for civic purposes is a nature um, constructed with civic purposes. So I think that this nature, this second nature, is exactly the core of our work today. So when you say that uh, maybe we are not able as the Romans, yes, we are not, but at the same time we are working on this second nature that uh, at least in the European uh, continent is extremely dense, is extremely uh, rich of, uh, of elements. And just to understand and to re 
cycle, revalorize those elements is for me a, a very important uh, effort. So maybe we are not doing it as the Romans, but we are working on the space, starting from uh, the, uh, the long territorial construction, and we are still working on that space, which is something connected to the inertia of space, space that uh, can change uh, politically, but that remains physically. And then uh, we have to adapt to different uh, ways of using, of looking at this space. Uh, so finally, we deal with, this, with that space, not with the uh, orientations, not with the ambitions that were behind that space. So the iner inertia of space is something I think is fundamental to, to consider uh, also, also today. About the ambition of a planner, of, of an urbanist, today it's clear that we are on a different planet and that uh, as you have this title, Spaces of Dialogue, is that mainly what we are doing is a dialogue uh, with all parties, all possible parties. I stop here for the moment. So, uh, if, if this first round is probably about uh, personal statements and so maybe even uh, Christian, because we together created this pavilion and did the, the design, uh, might disagree, but I, I would uh, write, I'd like to pose something rather radical. I think this, this kind of architecture is dead, you know, so um, that's also why we've been criticized for having these kind of white models on this white wall. It, uh, for some reason, reminds some people of a mausoleum. You know, of uh, something that uh, I think has come to a certain end, which uh, poses, especially for the young architects that are here now, the great chance to develop something new, uh, because it is an architecture based on representation, and a way of representation where architecture was always uh, relying on the power of uh, signs, you know, kind of a semiotic basis of architecture, and we've seen with these uh, um, uh, incredible possibilities of computer-generated design that uh, can generate any kind of forms that uh, we have come to, as I would call it, a kind of Rococo now, which was also the end of a certain period, the Baroque. And uh, it's up to you, you know, the young guys, are, maybe we are also a little bit involved in trying to find a new expression. And architecture in general, to answer your question, I think, can do much less than people thought in the 60s, but it can at the same time do much more. And that includes doing harm, being violent, as well as uh, you know, uh, organizing space in a way to probably create something like assembly, to create something like encounter, to create something like also what I would call what is really neglected, necessary separation. Because sometimes in social life it's also very important not to see somebody, not to meet somebody, and that's also something that architecture, I guess, is centrally about. But it's now the time, I think it's, it's high time, to really think about these kind of fundamentals, not so much in the way, it's a, it's a good step, uh, as Colas did it with these elements and everything, but to really uh, think about what architecture uh, can be or should be, because we have all these new means of production and these means, new, new means of design as well. We can use the computer to design, so we have to be able to, in a way, tell the computer what architecture is. Yes, I do not completely disagree with you, as you <laughs> announced. Um, in my opinion, architecture is a very strong medium of social change, which is not necessarily something positive. It is a cold medium compared to the other media you were talking about. Uh, digital media, Twitter, which are hot media in some way, which address all the senses and are very, very fast. Architecture is a slow medium, which is really one of its advantages. It takes time to realize architecture. You have to move a lot of mass, usually, and uh, this task involves a lot of people and a lot of money. We chose this topic of parliamentary architecture also because in the Rem Kohlhaas exhibition, two fundamentals are missing. Actually, money and power are not really addressed in the central pavilion. And I believe that money and power are very strong um, fundamental elements of architecture. And uh, we see a lot of these um, uh, parliaments that rely on old uh, symbols. So classicism is a very strong uh, message that even the parliaments that have been very recently built still use, and in this sense I really agree with you that uh, if we uh, go into a fundamental discussion of how power is distributed, how power is generated, 
we should refrain from using these old symbols and try to find something new. But um, I am not sure if uh, the, the, this uh, slowness and coolness of architecture as a medium is not very important and is actually the, the, one of the strengths of architecture that it takes a lot of time, that it's hard to build and it's hard to do away with again. And I think that society needs different media and one of these mediums, the slow medium of architecture, is really essential for all societies to create their form, to create the environment they want to live in. Uh, I would like to, to react a little bit on, uh, on your two uh, interventions because I discovered this, uh, uh, your uh, pavilion. But uh, I, I had immediately a strange feeling when we entered here that uh, you are putting on, with the same white paint uh, different stories, no? I mean, good and bad stories, uh, stories of dictatorship and stories of democracy story in which uh, the architecture is, um, for example, uh, expressing a regional architecture, a regional style, and stories in which uh, uh, architecture want to express something about the new, uh, the, 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 the forthcoming. So this operation of put everything on the same level can be interesting, but can be also a little bit uh, flattening. How do you distinguish them? I mean, or you are saying that we have no possibility <coughs> to express any critical judgment on, uh, on history. Critical ju judgment means also to distinguish, no? otherwise it's not a really critical one. Uh, uh, for me it's a problem to see different, uh, unless, unless you are proposing, I would say, sort of stylistic uh, judgment or stylistic um, uh, regard, but uh, I think I imagine it's something more than just, just that. But then because for me, the, a parliament, uh, a, a especially a democratic elected parliament, is something precious. Whatever style the building will have, I can reflect on this style, but I would never consider it the same as uh, something that was a fake parliament, for example. Uh, I would uh, say that if you want to compare something, you need uh, also a mode of abstraction. So, you know, to make, to bring things down to a certain level that you are able to compare them. And in this case, of course, because we wanted to integrate as many parliaments as possible, and, and here it's all of them, and it's one of the rare cases where you definitely can say it's all of something, because usually it's very difficult to say, no, this might be wrong, because there's a certain amount of nations and all the national parliaments are here. So we, in a way, reduce them to this, to this abstraction which also has to do, of course, with problems of gaining information and everything, because otherwise you would have, again, this Eurocentric, or you get much more information on European parliaments, like Africa is still like a black hole in the internet to get information and on these parliaments and everything. So that, that was partly technically, partly also to make this comparison possible. And at the same time, we were very much interested in the question of monumentality, so this reduction also to the volumes, and uh, in a way then reducing them to the same scale. Th we thought, you know, of course in a provocative and also maybe ironical way would force people to, you know, then make a, a point of, you know, make a decision or make a decision based on that, you know. But it, of course every reduction bears this problem of, uh, you know, uh, reducing something uh, to, to a point where you say, you know, there's so much quality uh, taken out that it's not possible. Second point is that for me it also has to do also all the people say we are ones of the pavilions who do not follow the theme of Kolas with absorbing modernity. But if we look at this, you know, uh, it is in a way about absorbing modernity to the extent that uh, one of the famous uh, uh, dictums of, of modernity was this form follows function. So we have uh, one function here. So there would be definitely should be a slight variation of the same architectural theme. But if you look at this uh, 196, there's there's nothing of that. And so I think it's it's also interesting that obviously Kohlhaas's starting point is is completely wrong concerning at least this typology. And so it's it's this this came out I think or it comes out even stronger through this radical abstraction. And it is obvious that form is not enough to define architecture. The interesting thing is that you have parliaments that look almost the same. One is from a dictatorship, one is from a democracy. So it is clear 
that architecture is the complete story, the story of its use, the story of the changes of architecture, and not a single object. Maybe this also answers your initial question uh, about uh, the Romans, yeah? because if we think of Roman architecture, it is so distant that it always can be regarded as an object, and we have a hard time to reconstruct all the changes, all the historical layers that are on this architecture. And uh, we tried in the catalog to add a little bit of story to each of these parliaments that if you go uh, beyond the level of the appearance of the buildings, you simply very easily can understand that they can look similar, but there are completely different stories. No, no, I, I mean, I, I really feel that, uh, let me say, if you think back at the Romans, no, there was this strange coincidence, at least stranger scene from from our times of, uh, uh, let me say, answering certain pragmatic questions like bringing water or managing the territory or whatsoever, at the same time, while at the same time uh, there was a clear uh, idea of how to represent the power, no? but that, that was basically because the power in itself was clear, no? and the relation among power and architecture and the, 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 media of, the medium of architecture was somehow is seen from a distance extremely linear, you know? uh, while, as we are saying nowadays, uh, this, this relation is always a bit of, of tune. You know? uh, it is because of the time of architecture, it is because basically any language has become uh, not relevant in terms of what he is able to say. You know? And is it even because uh, I think we are as a generation, um, really scared about trying to fix something into stone. No? Um, I mean, I, I give you a very pragmatic example, which is uh, in a way coming out from my professional experience. Uh, um, we are now building this, this building in Milan, no? which is a public building, it's called House of Memory. Um, it is supposed to represent uh, the relevant facts of Milanese history in the 20th century. And um, it is including inside uh, a huge archive, which is the archive of the history of liberation, uh, Second World War. Um, there will be sort of multimedia tools, uh, if we will have the money inside, in order to, to, to assess this soft memory. At the same time, we propose you know, on the facades to, to represent through the use of bricks, bricks used as, as, as pixels, uh, to represent on the facade scenes of this, um, of the relevant moments of collective history of Milan, uh, 20th century. And it was so hard to um, get this idea approved by the municipality. Just to give you an example, uh, there are 19 portraits at the intermediate level. Uh, we initially chose, uh, chose uh, um, very important people from the uh, 20th century um, no. in order just to start a discussion with the municipality, with the associations, in order to choose these people. No? And um, at a certain moment, the municipality proposed to have people from the 19th century, which they were, let me say, far enough, no, distant enough not to cause any problem. Um, what we managed to, to have at the end, which is quite telling about our contemporary condition, is to have people from the 20th century but unknown people. No? So it's faces taken from collective scenes, no? important collective scenes, I like the funeral of Aldo Mauro, no? this sort of stuff. But at the same time, they must be unknown, anonymous, no? so they cannot create any issue, any political discussion. And, and that's somehow, to me, to my understanding, is quite scary somehow, that we cannot agree you know, on how to represent. And if you mix this, uh, uh, this uh, possibility to represent with the fact that, for example, we don't even know as urbanists, for example, how to represent uh, or host a political discussion um, in the suburbs, you know, in the sprawl, I mean, which is the space for representation of uh, political discussion in the sprawl? I mean, 
I would say we, we got a very tricky and difficult to grasp situation no, in terms of... Yeah, but uh, we should not uh, underestimate uh, the capacity of a society to, to generate its own uh, political reflections even in the space you call suburb, but that is not suburb, is a form of urbanity at all uh, levels, not the sub urbanity, is a form of urbanity. Now, because we use this kind of Anglo Saxon uh, language that is very much, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not useful so much. So, much. so um, even in these other forms of urbanity that we call in different ways, if you see the uh, horizontal metropolis, etc., a certain degree of politicization is, uh, is going on. They have expressed their own political view. We may like, or we don't like, but they have expressed very clear, very clear. It's not by chance in that in all these areas, both in the north of Europe and in, uh, in the north of, uh, of Italy, that all the right-wing parties, very much based on sort of territorial identities, have been growing in the last uh, 30, uh, more or less 30 years. So we have to understand this. They have expressed. It's not that they haven't expressed. They have found their place, their, their spaces, their occasions. Sometimes it was the river, the place where this political thought work was expressed. I mean, some territorial figures were becoming the, the representation. We have to understand this. We are much far away from uh, the building here. It's all the territory that is uh, co contested and, and, uh, and part of this uh, redefinition. Let me use a word that I detest as identity. No, it's the redefinition of, of or a appropriation of certain part of the of the territory. So, I think they, this is going on with or without us. I think what I think is important for uh, for architecture and for urbanism, of course, uh, is to reflect on uh, in which way architecture and urbanism can be the vehicle through which express some societal values. Because maybe we have something to, to do here. You were criticizing the actual trends in, uh, in architecture, this Rococo story that maybe is, is touching its limits. I think that there is for sure a certain ingenuity from the side of architects. They are not understanding what political is going on and how, in fact, uh, we need in this moment to, to go back to the idea that we can express something. That is not just our personal thinking, but something that is a little bit more general or collective uh, through a project of, uh, of a part of a city or through uh, a building. And um, we, we discussed very much with Bernardo Secchi this, uh, this point. In an experience we had in Moscow, we were uh, working with, with other teams on this new Moscow. Uh, it was a quite sort of uh, fascinating but completely uh, strange. Uh, project, uh, the moment which, in which Medvedev was pres still president of Russia, and the idea was to decentralize some of the institutions of Moscow in the southwestern part of Moscow, something that uh, many capitals in Europe have uh, realized in, in, in the 70s or in the 80s, uh, if you take, for example, Paris, La Défense. So something not, not strange at the end, no? And uh, of course the idea of decentralizing some uh, political institutions, even the Duma, right, that it was to even uh, change the position, to realize, uh, um, to give space uh, so to other institutions and to imagine a, a new part of city that was constructed on this, for sure, was asking a reflection on a typical concept uh, of the Enlightenment, 18th century, that is civic magnificence, that in Milan also was very, very important in. Uh, reshaping the city at the moment of the Enlightenment. Civic magnificence is the idea that there, is, there are some periods in which a society expresses uh, its values through an urban language or an architecture. And I think we have forgotten this point. We don't need to go back to authoritarian periods, not to, to, to remember this. We should be able to do it also in a, in a, in a period we are living today. And I, I think that these the territories of uh, the new forms of urbanity are exactly the space where this kind of uh, 
uh, civic magnificence should be tested. Exactly because they are problematic from many points of view and they are clearly looking for a redefinition of, of what is collectible. So they have redefined what is individual, what is private, they have clearly stated, but they are still looking for something that is a little bit uh, connecting the different things. So for me this is a theme in, on which architects and urbans will have to work more. But, sorry. but it brings up the question as well, uh, can we still plan this or is it uh, something that organizes or has to organize it itself? In a way, you know, because uh, this depends where you think planning starts. To give one other example which goes in this line, uh, we also have the parliament of uh, Romania here in Bucharest, the huge Ceausescu Palace. And in 2000 there was a competition, urbanistic competition, won by Van Gerken, Market Partners, for um, balancing this huge monstrous building with some high-rise developments on one side and the park that really dealt with the history that happened. And this project was abandoned in about 2006 or 7, and now there is, right on the axis of the parliament, the new Alosa Kirche uh, being built, the church, an Orthodox church, quite the size of the uh, parliament or the Ceausescu Palace. And this, this is exactly what you were, were talking about, that people want to represent their ideology still in architecture. I am not fond of this uh, concrete example, but now you will have a strengthening of the Ceausescu Palace through this church building. And I think this is just um, a proof that maybe architects have forgotten how to deal with this. But uh, the Orthodox Church and the conservative elements of the Romanian society know very well how to express this power. They use the best place. And uh, I think the project by Gerkan was a project of enlightenment in comparison with this church. And this maybe is the downside of the heaviness of architecture. This church will be finished maybe in two years' time, and then it will stand there for the next hundred years. And also, now you're talking of a monument, but I'm not just talking of uh, monuments. I'm really talking of, of a, type, a language, an urban language. In Milan, this is very clear, the 18th century facade with a really clacked, uh, very clean, very... They are clearly alluding to uh, the uh, trust uh, in rationality, being able no, to, to give some uh, direction no, to, to, to the urban life, to the urban society, etc. Uh, that was a period, and that was the representation that is not only monuments, on the contrary, in the, in the language of, of, of the city. No, sorry. I think that we, we, even if you look at the, the different pressions that are coming from society, the different ways in which society is expressing itself today through movement. I think there is really, in this moment, the need to reflect, to go back to this kind of, uh, of discourse. And uh, maybe it will not be through this kind of monuments, but through a more everyday language, more, more uh, something that is more connected to spaces, uh, normal spaces. But still there is a problem, also for, for architects, which goes maybe in a different direction than the idea of just exploring Phantasmatic uh, objects, which can be interesting in some cases, but it's not when, for example, the phantasmatic object becomes just a small thing that is a, ri a ridiculous phantasmatic object, for example. No, but I mean, don't get me wrong, I completely agree with you that we should uh, uh, work on that level. But at the same time, um, I think you are really optimistic somehow, which is great, uh, which is great because. Um, Really, uh, if I see what's, what's going around in terms of production of, of space, uh, the only value which, is, which seems to be represented is in the end money. No? Um, I mean, even these churches, no? I see it, for example, in the Balkans. No? Um, you go to Pristina, no? and uh, in a way, in terms of representation, the only thing which is happening which is using religion, uh, it's, uh, let me say, uh, Turkish money, money, for example, invading the country and then building up a great mosque. No? It's happening uh, in Pristina, it's happening in, in, in Tirana, no? in Albania, in which, let me say, the Orthodox built a big church, no? now they will be, build a big Ottoman um, mosque. And, um, while, while on the level, let me say, of the 
which is extremely important what you have said, this level of normality, no? Whether this can be uh, happening without a radical redefinition of architecture, because uh, what I would say, this crisis of representation that is happening in the political system is also happening in architecture, and it starts with this kind of semiotic turn, and you're still talking about a language. I think that might be the, the fundamental mistake. Architecture is not a language as soon as it approaches to be a language, it is uh, uh, in a way uh, inferior to all the other languages because they are of course much better to express, so it's, it's much easier to um, get any kind of uh, definitions and everything uh, put upon an architecture because you know it, it is as an object existing but then become, get certain meanings attached to it. But I think if architects really want to approach these new forms of collectivity, they have to also, in a way, redefine architecture more into what they call now this kind of object orientation. Because for a long time now we've been told that architectural space will dissolve anyways into the media and will be of irrelevance because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't count anymore where you are, you know, and you have your smartphone in your hand and so that's the real space that you are living in and, and communicating in. And I think that's, that's wrong because we see there's a huge demand for architecture and there's also some very simplistic and brutal uh, material manifestations of all these walls, fences, gated communities that show us uh, how, how you know, enormously important architecture can be as a, as a sheer object. So I think uh, it just to continue in this, uh, in this belief that architecture um, as a composite of an object with a meaning can do this is, is, is not working anymore. But I was referring to uh, the language of the city, the, uh, not of, uh, of the singular building. I, on the contrary, I, I really think that a city develops a certain language that you need to understand this language when you are reading a city. So it, it is a heterogeneous uh, amalgam uh, of, uh, of languages, but uh, still you can, uh, you can work on, on this. But maybe if I can say something, because uh, we, we work uh, crossing scales, huh? so we are not the planners at work. We sometimes also do some buildings, some objects. And um, one recent uh, experience uh, uh, was about a, a very small thing uh, in, uh, inside the forest, uh, that is uh, in an educational center in Flanders. And um, I, I think that in each, something we have refused in the recent years is to consider the ideological aspect of uh, the building of building a certain space, and you are saying it with this, you know, we should not touch too much. Why? Why? In that case, uh, for example, we decided to organize uh, the, the, the space, the collective space, in a way that was clearly stating the fact that uh, being an, an educational center, the collective space had to face the more beautiful landscape. You can take this as a very strong, and strong as an ideological affirmation. And we did it. And I think we had to do it. Because architecture is ideological. The fact that it is ideological does not mean that ideology can change and space remain and you can reinterpret them, of course. But at the moment in which you design, you insert your values there. I'm sorry, it's not possible that you completely free yourself and you become like a neutral so, you, you bring, you together with others, with, uh, no? you bring no, no. a position. <laughs> no, no, sorry, but that's a misunderstanding. I just say that it's, it's not that you designed a building that was uh, meant to symbolize this opening, but you made this opening, you know. Yeah. So that's a very fundamental, objective uh, approach, you know? that's what I mean. But we had all these buildings that were meant to symbolize. If you knew a certain cultural connections between classicism and whatever, there were all these kind of meaningful signs that were meant to communicate something that is much better to communicate in other languages, you know. So tell me what you think of the one in the middle. Then. Which one? The, the, symbolizing the, and representing. That one, the, the, the Brasilia. Brasilia. Brasilia, you know. I think, about that. yes, but I think this is, is megalomania to a certain extent, you know, he was talking about these two hands, you know, the one covering and the one holding something, and so I think modernism was also very much about uh, this, this symbolism of, of how to... But the space you see there is something different than that. 
That's true, but it's also what I say, you know, because space then is very, very easily susceptible to being used with, and, and, and other meanings are attached to it, you know. We all know that, for example, the cell can be used for a monk, for meditation, but it can also be used as a prison. Yeah, but we, what we design is the cell. We don't either, you know, in a way. We, we are, you know, of course, to our clients, we are aware whether this client is actually, you know, giving us this contract because he wants a prison or something, and we have to be very aware of that. But fundamentally, and in the end, we are designing the cell, and it has an opening at a certain position and things like that. Absolutely, but there, the symbolic reading, maybe it is, uh, it's not able to describe that building. That is different, it's not just that. I think as architects, we should still strive for creating meaningful architecture. And meaningful architecture does not mean that you can translate this into a certain sentence and that we use architecture like we use written language and this is a one-to-one -one equivalence. So meaningful architecture means that this is an architecture that can take on meanings, that can be interpreted, interpreted by people over time. And there is architecture which is not as well able to offer this possibility as other architecture. I would call an architecture that is able to uh, convey meaning over a long period of time is better than architecture that dissolves in some way. And um, I am not so sure when you say that well, we have to do the opening, we have to do the walls, and this is what we do for sure. This is the material we use. But still we create structures that um, get some sort of meaning in the end. And there is a quality, there are different qualities that we can reach in there. If we say that architecture never can have a meaning, I think we lose something, honestly. So our, the work of architects is still to create meaningful architecture, I'm convinced. Yes, that's I, well, I, I want to say, and just put it in this radical, uh, you know, also to, to probably you know, to get, get uh, the audience thinking and maybe later there will be some questions. But, I think what I think is that we have to really redefine what this architectural meaning is. You know, it is because we have had this tendency, you know, starting with Venturi, with an, if you just need a sign next to a shed, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. We can put all this, and so this this would happen to all these shopping malls and everything. We have, we have this already. Yeah? So I think we have to really redefine what this kind of architectural meaning is that cannot be expressed easily in all kinds of other media and better in other, other kinds of media. So which would make us more or less. Uh, uh, completely superfluous, you know, we don't really have to do anything anymore. And as I say, you know, architecture can make very, very, uh, very, very strong and meaningful expressions uh, just by the, the, the sheer matter of fact that it is, it is there. And this has been forgotten for a long time because we, we had this kind of uh, um, uh, paradigm which, uh, which said, you know, space doesn't exist anymore, has no relevance and everything. And I think we are living now in an age which shows us very clearly how important space is with migration, with, uh, you know, all these uh, things. And, and, and uh, not, not for no reason, uh, the, the latest, one of the latest strong movements uh, against this kind of political forms of representations called itself Occupy. Because they really think, you know, we really have to uh, cover the ground again and, you know, make a stance at a certain position. And not just uh, Twitter or, or whatever. They always found a space where they actually congregated, which they occupied, and now in Hong Kong, you know, it's really important. It's all about now this war going on, who owns the financial district or who is occupying this part of the city. And uh, so that's, I think, is, is something very important. It's, it's the bodies of people as well. As, uh, and it's not all about uh, just uh, uh, s s meanings or um, ideologies that can be expressed much better in, in other languages that are much more suitable to, to, to express them. No, I mean, I, I agree no, on what you, you were saying, that somehow um, architecture as a media is extremely emphasized. No? Um, at the same time, I think that uh, maybe, and it's, I think it's a personal obsession, but I got the feeling that, for example, one of the key uh, topics about this idea of uh, sharing architecture, so architecture as a collective language, um, is the fact, and it was completely killed by the Enlightenment and even more by the modern, modern movement, I think it's beauty, in a way. So, um, if you accept as 
traditionally was, no, before the Enlightenment. Uh, the idea that beauty is uh, extremely democratic somehow, no? because uh, beauty is not precise, but it can communicate with, with everybody, supposedly. Uh, if you accept that, and if you reflect on the fact that for the last 300 years, uh, talking about beauty was, was completely forbidden, no? uh, I think there you might have a, a possible solution. Uh, and, and we don't have the tools to talk about it because it was such a taboo that nobody knows anymore what beauty might be in terms of collective understanding of it. But I think that their architecture and urbanism should really reconsider um, beauty as a goal, no? beauty as a, and not for the sake of it, just because it's the only. Uh, tool uh, which architecture has in order to communicate with, with everybody basically. And, and then in order to be felt as part of everybody, everybody's life somehow. Maybe I'm a bit obscure here and naive, uh, but... You know, it's, it's beauty that is. <laughs> no, I think you're right, but uh, again I would say you know that beauty has been corrupted during the last, uh, because it is, it has become a commodity in a way, you know, it was, uh, they, they still sell these kind of buildings as beautiful and, and, uh, and it's always, uh, if you look at the commercials, you know, that the, how they promote these things, uh, beauty is, is quite important and I, I think, of course, you know, beauty and aesthetics is really important because they are relying on presence much more than on meaning, although it's also a cultural thing, of course, you know, we all have a, a learned concept of what, what is beautiful and it would be the question if there's anything like an archetypal beauty or something like that. But I think it, what I, it's only the, the, the one point I want to make, it's not covering all of architecture, we need a resocialization of architecture because through this kind of semiotic architecture it has become commodified, you know, it was just something that uh, surfaced that uh, uh, certain meanings were attached to and it was sold like that and the spatial aspects really have been neglected. And, and if we are anything and if we have any chance to survive as architects, uh, we have to have this kind of unique selling point that we are the specialists for spatial organization. And we don't try to get too much into uh, discourses where other experts are much better than we are. Uh, because. Uh, uh, I think that's also something that's easily happening now with uh, all these projects going to Africa and, and telling them how they should build a school or whatever. You know, it's it's a, it's a very I think it's very difficult on a certain on a certain level. In fact, the question of beauty and the question of uh, meaningful there are two different uh, themes because when uh, you advocate this meaningful architecture, we have always to be worried about not worried but. Uh, to understand the meaningful for, for whom uh, uh, and that the for whom uh, can change the, the, the meaning of the meaningful unless we, we consider an architecture that uh, would uh, transcend uh, this problem by offering a sort of very open uh, possibilities uh, and then the whom can be not defined not, uh, but be, being meaningful needs to have a whom, so this is a, can, can be a problem when you go to Africa or, or, or even when you imagine something. I could imagine architectures with different potential for becoming meaningful. So there is the idea of architecture as an infrastructure that is filled with quickly changing environments that have a concrete meaning, but the overall structure has a general meaning. And I think we should talk about architecture on a very different level from the uh, regional, urban, infrastructural and environmental, micro-environmental level and this would allow um, a higher speed of change on, on a certain level which conveys different meanings and the stability below. And concerning the question of aesthetics and, and beauty, I think beauty requires this Kantian idea of Gemeinsinn and this is something I believe has been lost and cannot be easily regained on a global level. So uh, I'm much more relationalist in terms of in relation to beauty than uh, somebody who believes that this gemeinsinn can be acquired beyond the level of kitsch. Because this is for me the danger that we can all agree on, on what kitsch is, but very hard on what beauty is.
does anybody from the public would really like to to say something or even to ask something about this uh, this installation I mean I have a question because there's a, a, a concept, a, a subject that is somehow present in what all of you have said until now and I'd like to have a more direct opinion from each of you or <laughs> who feels so. Uh, the role of the architect, the ethics of the role of the architect because um, uh, okay, <laughs> since I deal with more uh, geopolitical subjects normally and uh, I research mostly about the role of architecture of the built environment uh, in conflict situations and, uh, and now today even here uh, I've seen some disturbing things in the Biennale and I heard uh, the position of uh, a famous architect, uh, Zaha <laughs> I don't know what to name, about the ethics of architecture, the fact that uh, the architect is not responsible uh, for uh, the messages uh, uh, work conveys or for what happens around uh, the building. Uh, uh, that uh, the architect design. So I would like to hear from you what you think if uh, uh, since I've heard nice things from the urban side <laughs> uh, what you think about it. I mean, uh, does the architect today have a role, have a, an ethic role uh, uh, regarding what is asked to design and uh, since we are trying to define if architecture has, uh, should have a meaning or not, so what's the role of the architect in this? This is a tough question. and I think one could formulate it as what do you refuse as an architect to build? Yeah. So by whom do, do you get a commission? Um, would you design a prison or not? One of the questions which is really extremely hard for me. I have no simple answer. Because you could argue that doing a good prison could really be a socially positive thing. On the other hand, it is a very critical thing. And even worse is the question of a refugee detainment center. There are people in there which have committed no crime whatsoever, but they are detained in the building that must not leave. Usually the conditions are very bad in these facilities in all the countries, in Italy as in Austria. Would you do a commission to do a better detainment center for refugees or not? So um, I must admit that I don't have an easy question, but I am, uh, an easy answer to this, but I'm sure that it is an individual decision and it's an ethical challenge, and that when Salah Hadid says there is no ethical problem, this is nonsense for me. But it's a very hard individual decision process that has to be decided by the individual architect. Yeah, um, for sure there is a ethical uh, problem, but uh, at the same time I think we have to clarify the marginal position we are in, because otherwise there is a, also a strange... Uh, um, we have to admit that we, we are quite marginal, so whatever position we are taking, we are not so relevant. This can, 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 can seem maybe a, a retreat. It's not a retreat. Uh, of course, I'm convinced, convinced that in any case, whatever small uh, thing we are, we are doing, we, we take a position and of course we should take a, a, something that can be defended and not... Uh, um, but at the same time, I don't know, even I, I've seen this uh, polemic about Saudi, but I think it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a false uh, question. Because... Uh, there is no, not real responsibility. I don't know. I, don't, I see so marginal all this in respect to what is going on. And that, uh, to tell the truth, so whatever we, we do, we are in any case not so important. Maybe we, we should start from this point. Otherwise, uh, we have the impression that our ethic position is really fundamental for the, the sort of humanity. Maybe not. Maybe not. We are simply marginal people talking to ourselves and, and something like, like this. <clears throat> then, in, uh, in the normal activity of, of architects and, and urbanists, uh, 
Yes, I think uh, the, the ethic is also to retreat, to have a step back, and to decide that you are not uh, participating. The, the nightmare, for, for me, <laughs> when you, say, you, 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 you go to, uh, to, to sleep and you say, but what I would do if someone will ask me to make a prison? For me, the nightmare, what I would do if someone will ask me to design a gated community? And uh, I think I will say no, simply. It's very good. The prison, no, because the prison is inside the, it's inside. the prison is, I mean, you can do very different prisons. No, there are prisons that are imagined as places for, uh, a, not re-education, but for education. So I think that with the prison one can reflect. With the gated community it's more difficult because that's uh, clearly... <laughs> So in that case, I think, uh, so I don't know, to tell the truth, how our colleagues uh, living, for example, in um, America Latina, where you only do gated communities. I mean, there is no other way in which the city is designed than that. And I feel, that's why I was thinking before, I was saying before that we are still very privileged in a way. Of course, uh, we are not obliged to take immediately very, this kind of very strong uh, position, but uh, yeah. First of all, we should not believe to be God. And second, uh, each one of us has to assume uh, contradictions and clearly. Well, I, mean, I, I think you are certainly right when you say that we are marginal. It's even true that I'm certainly marginal. Zadid is a bit less marginal. No, I mean, her opinion, yeah, it's, it's, just it's just about a, a slightly different scale, which might be might create a certain difference in terms of, yeah. No, because I, I want to clarify why I'm saying that. It's not against the I mean, it's not no, that no, the no. point. But the point is that uh, we cannot uh, tell ourselves that we are so important, because we are not. We are just arriving at the, at no, the no, no, final, no, no. final. So we are completely nothing in that. Uh, I'm not so sure about this. If you compare it to other academic uh, uh, professions, you know, like, there's hardly any medical doctor in the world that is as important as Sahadi in, in general, you know? I think, you know, Pugocci does it, everything, you know? He can save so and so many lives, but he's not a pop star, he's not, you know, because even in this whole world of media, she has gained, I think she has gained quite a status. And she, if, she would, if she would have a political opinion, and she would, she would reach quite a lot of people. And I think it's very cynical and it's typical of this kind of star architects that she is behaving the way she's behaving and she has to also follow this kind of economical forces. She has an office now with 300 people that she has to employ, so she has to take any dictator's approach to, to get the thing running. You know? And probably it's also this kind of despair of herself of being in this thread mill, of not being able to escape and with what kind of uh, uh, fantasies she started her job and now she's in this kind of circus uh, that leads to these kind of uh, opinions that she mentions, but I think compared to other professions on the same level of education, architects are quite important. And I think it's, it's, and, and it's, they have quite a big role, even if it's, you know, uh, if it's a role not like, uh, uh, we, we, we assume that politicians are so mighty, we even assume that certain economic leaders are so, so important and mighty. But I think there's a, a medium level of influential uh, intellectuals and in a way social workers and architects could do this. So I think, uh, to answer your question, I think every architect has to have a theory of society for himself, you know, and that's something that's completely missing. They don't give a damn about society, you know, they don't give a damn about the relationships of people and how to organize them and what kind of spaces they should be surrounded by. And, and that's what they just want to make money and make, sorry for that, beautiful things. They think they're artists, which is the worst, I think, you know, to consider architects as artists. And, and that has led to all this uh, stardom and, 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 uh, and strange developments, I think, to, to, to a large extent. And of course, there's not this one theory of society, but at least every architect has to be aware it, in a way he is directly working and, and uh, influencing the relationships between people, even whether he builds a gated community or a prison, where a gated community is nothing but voluntary prisoners, as Paul has put it. And uh, so, I think that's that's the pity, you know, that they they just don't care. Great. I think it's a great conclusion, no? This one. <laughs> Unless there's other no, I think it's fine. Okay, thank you, thank you, Paul. <laughs>